Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Abnormal Vital Signs Deep Dive. We will be getting started about five minutes after the top of the hour, so uh, just hang tight. A couple of reminders, you will be muted for the entire call. Please submit any questions via the chat function and address it to the entire audience. A member of our team will answer questions at the end of the session if time allows. Otherwise, any frequently asked questions will be posted on our website for future viewing. And don't forget that you can visit the website listed here for a copy of today's slides, as well as a copy of the intervention bundle. And we will get started in about five minutes. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. We are going to wait about five minutes for all of the callers to log into the platform and then we'll go ahead and get started. As a reminder, you can download a copy of today's intervention bundle in the handout section of the control panel. Hello everyone, welcome to the Abnormal Vital Signs Deep Dive. The session will begin shortly. Um, as a reminder, all of the attendees will be muted for the entire call. Submit your questions via the chat function um, in the control panel and please address your questions to the entire audience. A member of our admin team will answer any questions that you have at the end of the session if time allows. Otherwise, frequently asked questions will be posted on our website for future viewing or discuss during subsequent office hours. And then please keep in mind that you can find a copy of all of today's uh, recorded slides as well as um, a recording of the actual session at the link that's listed here. We are providing CME CNE credit. You'll 
will see in the control panel of today's uh, webinar platform an opportunity for you to download a copy of the disaster bundle, the abnormal vital signs bundle, as well as the survey information for CNE and CME credit. All right, Kate, I can see that we're about um, at about 80 callers now, so I'm going to go ahead and start recording today's session. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the deep dive for the Abnormal Vital Signs Bundle. Today is June 26, 2018. We're going to go ahead and get started with some acknowledgments. The HRSA EIC is supported in part um, by the grant that's listed here. Any of the information or content that's described in the next series of slides um, are not the official policy or statement of the entities that are listed here. As a reminder, we are offering CME and CNE credit for today's webinar. Uh, please visit the website that is listed here to access the survey. And the name of today's learning session is called Abnormal Vital Signs Deep Dive. And so here are our talking points for today's session. We will have an overview of the IHI collaborative model, discuss some of the common concepts of QI collaboratives. We'll discuss some of the resources that are available to all of our affiliate sites. We'll spend some time discussing the culture of the collaborative and then give you a deep dive into our intervention bundle. And then there will be time to discuss next steps and housekeeping. So the Pediatric Readiness Quality Collaborative is based on the IHI collaborative model that you see listed here. Um, over the last year and a half, our team has worked feverishly to really launch some of the initiatives that you'll hear us discuss today. Uh, that really begins with topic selection. So members of the EIC identify particular areas or issues in healthcare that were really ripe for improvement. Um, for the last six months, we've had support from our faculty recruitment, particularly these individuals or subject matter experts um, or application experts that have um, direct experience with quality improvement or the subject matter that we are discussing. Um, these individuals have helped us identify appropriate aim statements, measurement strategies, along with the list of evidence-based changes. Um, then we have the enrollment of our participating teams. And that's where you guys come in. And so September um, or summer of 2016, we held informational webinars and began a really intensive outreach to identify hospitals that were willing to engage in this momentous collaboration. And so we're happy to announce, happy to announce that 146 hospitals across 16 states have committed to the PRQC. So here's where the operation piece comes in. Um, the EIC admin team will be hosting a series of webinars and learning sessions over the next year and a half. Um, to really bring together multidisciplinary teams from each organization, along with the subject matter experts to exchange ideas and best practices. During those learning, learning sessions, we'll spend time reviewing performance on a team level, um, as well as aggregate, and discussing next steps. Uh, during that year and a half, we will engage in quality improvement or iter iterative PDSA cycles. Uh, this will be the time that your hospitals are really launching the improvement efforts, uh, testing different change strategies, um, and working towards our goal. Some of the common concepts that you'll hear us discuss today as well as future webinars are aim statements, the model for improvement or plan, do, study, act cycles, quality measures and metrics, and some of the tools that you will be using over the next year and a half include key driver diagrams, workflows, process maps, SWOT analyses, um, fishbone diagrams, cause and effect diagrams. And so you're probably wondering, well, what support do we have for affiliate sites? So level one begins with our trainers. 
these are individuals that have really committed to providing mentorship to a series of affiliate hospitals on their team. These trainers have expertise in pediatric emergency medicine, quality improvement, as well as emergency medical services for children. The next level of support that we're offering for all of our affiliate sites is formal QI education. So we will be providing access to QI modules through the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's Open School uh, that will be released on July 1st. Two champions from every site will have the opportunity to complete the entire QI education uh, open school program. And then over the course of the next year and a half, we'll be reinforcing these concepts through webinars, learning sessions, um, and targeted discussions. The next level of support that we'll be providing are the sharing of best practices at intervention-specific webinars and learning sessions. So there will be sessions dedicated primarily, for example, to today's um, abnormal vital signs, where sites can submit questions, um, get one-on-one -on -one feedback with our subject matter experts, and we'll also be uh, sharing the most recent up-to-date information um, that's being released through publications. And so that's level four, the distribution of new content and resources that are available. So now what I'll do is pass the mic to Kate, and she's gonna discuss PRQC culture. Great, thank you, Crystal, and good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on uh, where you are currently located. Uh, but thanks so much for joining today. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to attend our last deep dive, uh, what we wanted to do is just introduce the culture of the Pediatric Readiness Quality Collaborative. And this is really true of any uh, quality improvement collaborative. And that is that we are all here uh, to improve. Um, and even uh, small steps in, in improvement need to be celebrated. We know that each of us is at a different starting point as we begin uh, this journey to improve emergency care for children. And so as we move through this process, some of us will uh, approach different barriers. Uh, there will be different enablers. And so we can all teach and we can all learn from each other as we overcome those challenges. In order to make this successful, it's really important that we view each other as a team. And in order to really be a team, we have to be transparent about the challenges that we're facing and about the progress that we make. So we encourage all of you to be very open um, about how you move down this path uh, together so that we can learn from each other. This is not about shaming. This is about celebrating those small steps and improvement. If you go to uh, the next slide, just to mention briefly the purpose of these team meetings. Uh, so as Crystal mentioned, each of you is part of a team. There are 16 teams um, across 16 states. And while the trainer uh, is certainly uh, devoted to this process and um, will help to guide all of uh, the sites through this collaborative, um, it's really important uh, that there be that transparency at these team meetings. And so these team meetings are exclusively for uh, you uh, as affiliate sites and for your trainer to work together uh, to overcome certain barriers and enablers. The trainers will be in charge of scheduling these meetings over the coming months. Some of these may occur uh, virtually or through teleconference. If you are uh, located in a similar geographic area, uh, you may have the opportunity to have these occur in person, uh, which is wonderful to be able to have that face-to-face -face time and really get to know each other. But during these meetings, there'll be a number of topics that might be discussed, uh, certainly in these first few months, trying to de decide which bundle uh, you might start with. Uh, what are the current gaps that exist at your, your particular site? Uh, where do you have the buy-in? And how will you move forward? Um, over the next months, you'll also begin to develop an implementation plan. What are the certain strategies that you might take uh, to uh, impact change or improvement uh, in your uh, particular emergency department? How do you get buy-in uh, to be able to do that? Uh, and then really working through some of these quality improvement tools uh, the development of smart aims, the identific identification of specific change strategies. And then, of course, quality improvement. Uh, we can't be sure of true improvement without measurement or uh, measuring progress. And so um, certainly all improvement is change, but not all change is necessarily improvement. And that's why this measurement piece is really critical. Um, each site will be in charge of their own 
uh, data and we'll be able to see their own progress, but we really encourage you to share that progress with your teams so that you uh, can really uh, obtain the support that you need to move forward. So uh, with that, we will be launching into uh, this deep dive, which is the recognition and notification of abnormal vital signs in pediatric patients. And we do have a um, series of uh, items planned for today. Uh, so we're going to be starting uh, initially with an introduction. We'll be walking you through the AIM statement. Uh, we'll be talking about quality measures and data collection. Uh, we'll finish up with some uh, specific intervention strategies and finally resources. And uh, Crystal and I will be bouncing back and forth uh, with each other over the course of this. So I'm going to turn this back over to Crystal for a few minutes to talk about Thanks. consideration. Thanks, Kate. So this intervention bundle was designed exclusively for sites that are participating in the PRQC. And so as such, we are asking that you not share any of the content that you see on today's slides or within those intervention bundles without written consent from the EMSC Innovation and Improvement Center. Uh, this intervention bundle may conflict with some of the existing local QI efforts at your hospital. Um, you're encouraged to definitely seek support from your ED and hospital leadership regarding the adoption of these proposed change strategies um, as standard practice for your emergency department. The resources that are listed in this bundle, be it evidence-based guidelines, clinical algorithms, or tools, are really for supplemental use and should not be viewed as formal recommendations for pediatric care. Clinicians who wish to carry out accurate measures of health, I'm sorry, heart rate in children should be aware that manual measurements of heart rates, which is common practice in many settings, might underestimate the true rates. And so in these children, measurement of heart rate by automated methods provides more accurate results. Uh, along those same lines, it's recommended to count respiratory rate for a full 60 seconds in the case of infants to increase the accuracy of respiratory rate measurement. And then each physician or practitioner must definitely use his or her independent judgment in the management of a specific patient and is responsible in consultation with the patient and or the patient's family to make the ultimate judgment regarding care. And so now I'll pass it back to Kate, who will introduce our subject matter experts. Great, thank you. So we were really grateful to have the support of two uh, particular subject matter experts for this uh, bundle. Um, the first is Deanna Gillespie, uh, formerly a nurse manager at Dell Children's Medical Center and coordinator for pediatric readiness efforts in Central Texas, uh, and newly a facility director at the Physicians Premier um, Emergency uh, Department in Bastrop. Uh, we're also grateful to have uh, Dr. Madeline Joseph, who is a professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. She is the past chair of the uh, Pediatric Committee for the American College of Emergency Physicians, and currently the president of the Florida chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and brings with her a long history and experience in quality improvement work within the emergency department setting. So we're grateful to have the support, uh, wisdom, and expertise of both of them. So uh, when it comes to uh, abnormal vital signs, we know that uh, for high quality emergency uh, care, uh, that we have several pieces that need to happen. First off, we need to be able to identify patients who are at risk for clinical deterioration. And this can be at times uh, subtle when it comes to pediatric patients. Um, we need to be able to match that severity of illness to uh, the appropriate level of care. Uh, and then identify uh, opportunities for timely intervention. Uh, and this is really key um, to making sure uh, that children receive the right care at the right place at the right time um, is those timely interventions and early recognition. So that's really the impetus for uh, this bundle and the work that we're going to be undertaking through this bundle. Um, as many of you are aware, there are a number of standards that currently exist for normal vital signs ranges. You'll see those in APPLES and PALS. Uh, there are several others that exist. Um, all of these are referenced within uh, the box site so that you can find those. We are not endorsing any one standard or tool. 
That is for you at your site and within your team to work out. Uh, what we do recommend is that you evaluate the pros and cons of each of these relative to the available resources um, that exist at your site. Uh, so that's just really a disclosure to let you know that we're not uh, going to enforce any particular standard over another, but just that your site should adopt a standard for normal vital sign ranges. We know that uh, when it comes to pediatric patients, of course, that vital signs do vary by age and or weight, uh, which is why such standards exist. Oftentimes, this has resulted in the development of such things as badge buddies uh, that help uh, nurses, physicians, technicians, and healthcare providers on the front lines to really identify what those ranges are for a particular patient. Uh, and we know that the accuracy of those uh, assessments depends on using appropriately sized equipment uh, for those patients. Uh, we also know that when it comes to the pediatric population in particular, uh, that oftentimes they can be anxious. Uh, sometimes they, you know, present with, of course, pain and or fever. And that can make it really difficult to differentiate um, those children who are at risk for clinical deterioration. And so this is really where having uh, these standards in place and having a process in place to identify those children with abnormal vital signs is going to be critical. Um, many sites, many children's hospitals have developed these clinical decision support tools uh, to help guide uh, providers on the front lines. And, and again, this is the impetus for this bundle in that we encourage uh, each of you that plan to work on this bundle to develop such guidelines or clinical decision support tools at your site uh, to make sure that all children are being identified as early as possible and that interventions can be started as quickly as possible. We can go to the next slide. Uh, all of you are aware of the National Pediatric Readiness Project. We've talked about this. The national assessment was initially done in 2013, um, and that was really the phase one to assess the initial capabilities of our nation's emergency department to meet the needs of children. And through this uh, assessment, we identified a number of gaps. Certainly, there's been improvement over the last decade, but a number of gaps that exist with a median pediatric readiness score of 69 on a 100-point scale. And we know that that variation in score um, is significant across the annual pediatric ED volume, where those lower volume sites that see children less regularly, not surprisingly, are less ready or less prepared um, to meet the, the needs of a critically ill or injured child. And those who see uh, children on a regular basis uh, are used to uh, perhaps having a, a higher frequency uh, or presentation of those critically ill or injured children. So not surprisingly, uh, they tend to have higher readiness scores. But when it comes specifically to uh, vital sign criteria, what you'll see on um, the next slide is a, an assessment that was done. This was based on the national aggregate scores uh, specific to vital signs uh, in the pediatric population. And so what we're seeing here is that the great, great majority of sites have temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate recorded on nearly every single child that presents to the emergency department. And this is not surprising. When we look at uh, many of the triage tools that currently exist today, uh, they're reliant upon temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate to adequately triage them. Um, but when it comes to blood pressure monitoring and pulse oximetry, while their monitoring is available, uh, they may not actually be recording blood pressure or pulse ox on every single child. Um, and this may be because of challenges uh, during the triage process or obtaining these um, particular measures uh, based on um, the size or availability of equipment, uh, or it may be uh, uh, just related to a lack of understanding uh, that this is actually uh, a critical measure uh, to take in terms of identifying that child that may be at risk for deterioration. But if you go to the next slide, what you'll see on this slide is the number of sites uh, that actually had a process in place to notify uh, caregivers or, or providers of abnormal vital signs uh, when they existed in the pediatric patient. And again, not surprising, you see a range across those uh, pediatric emergency department volumes. So for those low volume sites, only about 60% uh, actually had a process in place for notification of abnormal vital signs. And as we get to those higher volume sites, you start to see more and more have a notification process in place. But surprisingly, 
even at the very high volume sites, only approximately 80% uh, had a process uh, for really identifying those children early on in order to uh, facilitate uh, emergent interventions as needed. So we know, of course, that the baseline indicators of health are, of course, temperature, pulse, and respiratory rate. Um, and this is really key to identifying um, the ill or injured child and to being able to triage them appropriately. There are certainly clinical practice guidelines that exist. We know that temperature, pulse, and respiratory rate are all part of uh, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome criteria, SIRS criteria that exist, and we recognize these uh, as really being essential. And so, as you saw from the national data, that really across the board, all children are receiving these baseline uh, three vital signs at minimum. But we also know that pulse oximetry is a critical element. And when we know that the leading cause of cardiac arrest in children is respiratory failure, uh, this becomes more, um, more important. And we know that through the use of pulse oximetry, that this may increase the identification by 20 to 30 percent of children uh, with respiratory distress compared to just using clinical signs alone, such as grunting or altered mentation. And so this increases really our threshold for identifying those children at uh, risk for early deterioration. A number of other vital signs that we, of course, want you to really consider uh, in terms of integration into your emergency department is blood pressure. We realize that uh, this is a challenge for many sites, a challenge in obtaining this due to children who are crying or distressed. Um, it's not uh, typically a component in the most common triage tools. But we're realizing more and more that hypertension is becoming a major issue uh, among the pediatric population as obesity rates increase. We also recognize that blood pressure uh, can be really important in identifying children with congenital heart disease that may not have been previously diagnosed. Um, this has certain, certainly occurred uh, on numerous occasions for many providers uh, where this was uh, one of the rare findings that was used to identify congenital heart disease. And then lastly, of course, shock. Um, we know that uh, decreases in blood pressure are often a late sign of shock, um, but because of challenges in identifying uh, mental status changes in children or believing that maybe the signs we're seeing are related to anxiety or pain or fever, uh, that we can miss these subtle signs. And so blood pressure is really critical in identifying children at risk. Pain, too, often goes unrecognized in children, and because it's unrecognized and not always assessed, it's undertreated, and this is particularly challenging in those children that don't have the capability of uh, verbalizing their pain or who may have developmental delays that uh, are a barrier to them being able to communicate with us effectively. And then lastly, mental status, really as a pediatric vital sign. Uh, which is that, uh, you know, we often assess this in the injured or trauma patient, um, but it's less universally assessed in the ill, uninjured patient or uninjured child. Uh, yet we recognize that this is a key component of shock in children, that in the early stages of shock, there's often restlessness, anxiety, uh, as they uh, move through um, a range of mental status uh, deterioration. Uh, to sleepiness and eventually lethargy. So if we move on uh, to the next slide, uh, when we talk about mental status, there are certainly a number of tools that exist. Uh, there's the very simple AVPU system, alert, verbal, pain, unresponsive. There are also scales for Glasgow coma scores uh, in the pediatric population. But know that signs of, uh, of shock in children can be subtle. And this is why when we look at those signs, we know that level of consciousness should really be a piece of this and why, I, why we as a team strongly encourage you uh, to try to integrate mental status assessments in to all children uh, who are being triaged uh, through your emergency department. If you go to the next slide, when it comes to pain, we know that if we don't identify or consider pain, that that can uh, shift our uh, clinical decision making, uh, understanding that pain is present can help guide us to certain diagnoses and certainly helps to guide our pain management interventions. 
And there have been a number of studies that have since come out that have demonstrated that untreated pain can have long-term repercussions in children, including increased pain sensitivity, impact on immune functioning and neurophysiology, and of course, the attitudes uh, towards healthcare uh, in general. And so this is really a critical aspect um, and should be a, a integrated into all uh, pediatric triage processes. Uh, we know that when it comes to pain assessment, we have to use different scales based on different age ranges. In the pre-verbal child or the child who doesn't yet understand um, the impact of uh, expressions as a demonstration of levels of pain, uh, we may have to use the FLAC scale or the CHIOP scale uh, to really demonstrate um, or identify pain. As we get into the older uh, populations of 4 to 12-year-olds, we can start to look at faces scales, those pain scales, to try to identify pain. And then in the much older child um, and the teens, uh, really we can start to use those numeric rating scales that uh, we use in adults. The other piece that we would like for you all to think about and consider is that we know that mental health is of epidemic proportions uh, in this country. Um, and that this is really uh, the most common health issue that's now faced by our nation's school-aged children. And as providers on the front lines and emergency departments, we have a real opportunity, and I would even say responsibility, to help to identify uh, children at risk uh, for suicidality, uh, depression, and other mental health disorders. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that there have been recent reports that nearly 20% of children now suffer from diagnosable mental emotional or behavioral health disorders. Um, this is a, a graphic demonstrated by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, where you see that some 15 million children uh, and young adults are struggling with this. And we really have an opportunity uh, to impact um, and identify uh, opportunities for care in these children by integrating mental health into um, our triage or assessment processes. Uh, and lastly, uh, in this next slide, what you'll see is that suicide rates in particular are on the rise. Um, what is interesting to note that they're on the rise um, mostly or no more, nowhere more so uh, than in rural counties. And many of you are in emergency departments located in rural counties. And so I think we really do have a responsibility to evaluate children uh, particularly in those uh, preteen and teenage years uh, who may be at risk. Uh, suicide rates among teen girls has reached a 40-year high. Uh, you'll see these increases across um, all, um, all races, socioeconomic classes, and genders. Uh, and this is a real opportunity, I think, as we begin to look at our triage processes uh, to try to better integrate mental health into, into um, that, that whole process. Uh, and so you'll see with this bundle that we do ask about whether mental health is even being assessed uh, in your emergency department and how you might integrate that in a meaningful way into your triage processes. So if you go to the next slide, um, there are certainly a number of triage tools that currently exist. Um, one of the most commonly used is, of course, the Emergency Severity Index. Uh, this uses a numeric scale of levels one through five. Uh, with one being the most critical, five being the least. Uh, and what you'll see is that while well, this emergency severity index certainly incorporates uh, these age-dependent differences in terms of anatomy and physiology and development, blood pressure is not one of the uh, specific inclusion criteria. And I think the reason why blood pressure is often not obtained um, in many children uh, across emergency departments in this country. Um, in fact, if we look at the emergency severity index in detail, it's really limited to lethargy and severe pain, but also doesn't really look at mild to moderate pain um, and or other ranges of mental status assessment, such as restlessness and anxiousness. So I bring this up only to highlight the fact that while uh, some of these triage tools are very effective in identifying uh, immediate resources, they are not necessarily the most effective in uh, helping to create early intervention uh, strategies in your emergency department. There are other tools, such as the pediatric early warning systems, 
Um, this is certainly a tool that has been utilized in inpatient capacities primarily uh, to focus on early identification of deterioration and to mobilize uh, rapid response teams and the like to improve clinical outcomes. Um, it has been occasionally adopted in emergency department settings as well, along with the CHOOS or the uh, Children's Hospital Early Warning Systems, which is a modification of this. So all of these um, tools are available to you in box, and if you'll go through the next slide, you'll see just uh, some examples of these tools. This is the Emergency Severity Index. For, uh, it goes through, you know, the lethargic uh, child or severe pain and looks at certain vital signs based on age uh, criteria, including pulse oximetry, um, but you'll see blood pressure isn't necessarily identified as one of the metrics, often because blood pressure is considered a late sign in children. Um, you'll also uh, see, if you go to the next slide, um, some other tools like the pediatric early warning signs, which uh, you can access these through our box site. Um, my goal is not to go through every one of these in details, but primarily to let you know that these are available to you um, and are opportunities to be adopted into your uh, emergency department setting um, based on the buy-in that you receive. The last I want to focus on is this pediatric septic shock triage tool. Uh, which you'll see this is part of um, the Septic Shock Collaborative that was um, uh, implemented over the last several years. And in this collaborative, you'll see that um, because of the subtleties in identifying shock in patients, uh, that in this triage tool, uh, blood pressure was absolutely a component in that early recognition. And so I just highlight this again to encourage you all to consider the importance of blood pressure as a component of all of your uh, core vital sign assessments. So at um, this point, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Crystal to begin to walk you through uh, the intervention bundle. Thanks, Kate. Um, as a reminder, you can download a copy of today's intervention bundle um, by expanding the control panel on the GoToWebinar platform, and you'll see a section that says um, handouts, and you can download today's intervention bundle. So what we're going to do is start with the AIM statement, and this is the global AIM statement for any site that is working on um, this particular bundle, and it's that by December 2019, 100% of the pediatric patients with abnormal vital signs will be identified by the healthcare providers in their emergency department. We are not going to specify what the pediatric patient population, um, the criteria for the pediatric patient population is going to be dependent upon the site. So one of the things you may remember is that we asked each site to complete um, a site survey or an environmental scan, and one component of that was telling us the age range of the patients uh, that are seen at your site. So um, that's one of the things that we will not define for you, but whatever you constitute as a pediatric patient at your ED facility will be included in this data set. So now what we're gonna do is show you just a quick snapshot of a key driver diagram. And really, this is a tool or a visual display of a team's theory of what drives or contributes to the achievement of a project aim. Uh, this clear picture of a team shared view is a useful tool for communicating um, to your stakeholders while you're testing and working through the implementation of your project. Um, so what I'll do is I'll walk you through the major components of this intervention bundle, and we'll start with the AIM statement. So by December 2019, remember 100% of the patients will have their um, abnormal vital signs identified by the healthcare team. Uh, we will do that by working on a series of intervention bundles, and those bundles will relate to having a written procedure or guideline for pediatric vital signs. The other category will be interventions related to the notification strategy. There will be a series of interventions related to optimizing your current EMR platform. The next piece will be education and then reinforcement of that education for the care team. So let's start with key driver one, the written procedure and guidelines for pediatric vital signs. A standard set of vital signs consists of temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, pulse ox, blood pressure, pain, and mental status when indicated. Pediatric patients' weight should be documented in kilograms in the medical record. 
And so based on that statement, these are the proposed strategies that we're encouraging sites to adopt. So we're asking that you develop a written procedure guideline that provides instructions on how to measure and document your vital signs for pediatric patients. We know that some sites already have um, some policy or guideline in place, but we want you to consider some of the other sort of aspects that or domains that you should consider including or revising or amending to your existing document. Some of those recommendations is that there should be a recommendation for the methods of measurement for specific age groups, that you should have a vital sign norm for your pediatric patients, as Kate mentioned. There should be some site-specific thresholds for abnormal vital signs. There should be some statement about the preferred time frames for initial assessment, the frequency of reassessments, and then the follow-up of patient procedures. The next element is that the policy or procedure or guideline should have recommendations for the communication of those clinical concerns based on the abnormal vital signs, i.e., what's the notification process like for your hospital, and then standards for documenting that vital sign in the patient record, as well as the process for documenting the escalation of care should be noted in that guideline. So now what we'll do um, is look at another aspect of this first key driver. So with this written policy and procedure or guideline statement, we're asking that you consider adopting a standing order that can be used by nurses, and this could be a standing order for comfort measures and medication, and so this is something that can be integrated into your written procedure or guidelines. So the next area of focus for this intervention bundle will relate to notification strategies. So all sites should have some formal notification process to ensure that each patient's needs and clinical concerns are addressed appropriately and efficiently upon the recognition of an abnormal vital sign. With that being said, here are the strategies that your site might consider adopting um, over the next year and a half. So one of those um, would be that ED leadership and the care team um, must decide the threshold for vital signs that warrant escalation of care a priori. So that would be something that's included in your uh, policy or statement from Key Driver 1. We'd also ask that you consider adopting a validated triage tool for certain conditions. The next piece is that ED leadership and care team should select the recommended time frame for the collection of vital signs and the subsequent actions by the care team. So an example of that could be the time from arrival to the first set of vital signs should occur within 15 minutes. And so what we'd like to do is uh, remind you that we have several resources available on our file sharing site. And one of those is the septic shock protocol, which outlines timeframes, and we'll show you that slide in a second. And here you'll see it. So this is an example of that change strategy. Texas Children's Evidence-Based Outcome Center developed an algorithm for septic shock. And you'll see here that from the time of arrival through the first five minutes, they've outlined a series of actions that need to occur during the triage area. Then you'll see requirements for the 20-minute mark and 60-minute mark. Now, this is just an example of what can be used for septic shock, but we are proposing that sites identify opportunities where they can optimize or make more efficient um, processes related to the, the collection of abnormal, of vital signs during the triage process. Your next intervention strategy is notification. So we are proposing that each site define the communication process that they'll use for notifying the care team of an abnormal vital sign. This could be verbal communication, and it's the direct relay of information between the nurse and physician. It could be that you decide to develop a script to notify the physician that that abnormal vital sign is of grave concern or is of concern. Um, it could be that you decide to use a color coding system in the patient's chart to signify that abnormal vital sign. It could be an electronic alert that's sent to providers or a spe special designation on the ER tracking board. The other element to this bundle is that teams may decide um, to determine where patient vital signs are collected and where the patient is subsequently transported within the emergency department. And then the next one is that we ask that you develop a recommended course of action when vital signs are out of range. That could be initiating evidence-based guidelines, pathways or protocols. 
the next area of focus within this bundle is EMR optimization. So we realize that nearly 95% of our sites have it has an electronic medical record. Um, some sites also have the ability to adapt their platform um, for certain needs, and so we've listed some of those here. Um, some opportunities for improvement may be implementing alerts within that EMR platform that will notify the care team when a particular vital sign is out of range. Um, it could be integrating a clinical decision support tool similar to what Kate showed earlier that um, sort of evaluates a combination of factors during the triage process and notifies the team, or it could be implementing standing physician orders. And so should a site decide that they'd like to work on EMR optimization, we could definitely put together a team um, that will help stratify the EMR platforms so that there can be some sharing of best practices. So if you're a Cerner site, if you're an Epic site, there may be an opportunity to share builds um, amongst each other. The next intervention strategy um, is education. So uh, with the implementation or um, with the development of new guidelines and policies, there's always a need for educating the care team. We're asking that you develop some training or educational program um, that really focuses on the importance of collecting a standard set of vital signs in pediatric patients, the importance of early recognition of those abnormal vital signs, some of the components of your site-specific um, guidelines and procedures, and then also consider how you'll actually uh, deliver that education. Would it be in your current learning management system, such as HealthStream, um, could you consider using it at brown bag sessions or case reviews? Um, it's totally up to your site. Whatever is sort of um, the standard or the culture for your hospital, we just encourage that you roll out some sort of education to your care team about the importance of vital signs. You also may consider hosting a PALS course um, for your ED care team. And then, as I mentioned earlier, host brown bag sessions or case reviews. Um, of pediatric patients periodically to highlight opportunities for improvement in the early recognition and escalation of care. And then lastly, we know that with adult learners, learning one time or being introduced to a concept one time doesn't stick. There should be cues within their environment to reinforce that information. And so here are a couple change strategies to consider. Um, you, if you have access to a simulation uh, center, you may want to try tabletop exercises to recognize patients with abnormal vital signs. Um, you may also do environmental cues, so posters in triage area with normal vital ranges, posters with scoring tools of abnormal vital signs. Um, you may decide to purchase or create pocket cards or badge cards for your care teams with those normal vital sign ranges or direct feedback to the care team following chart audits. These are some examples of pocket cards that are currently available on the internet uh, for purchase, and these are just some random examples. So you'll see here the Wong Baker Faces pain rating scale, as well as the ESI triage algorithm that Kate mentioned earlier. So now what we're going to do is switch gears and really talk about how are we going to measure our performance. Um, and so what I'll do is walk you through a series of measures for this particular bundle. Um, and really measures are our way of assessing and comparing the quality of health care in our organization. Um, structural measures typically tell us something about um, the health care providers, their capacity, the systems in which they provide care. Process measures really give us an indication of um, how well a provider or the healthcare system um, is able to provide that care, uh, be it through the delivery of services, of the efficiency of those services that we're providing. Um, and then lastly, we have outcome measures, but this bundle in particular does not have any outcome measures. Um, but just to mention, those are the ones that reflect the impact of the healthcare service or intervention that we're rolling out. So here you'll see the quality measures for this bundle. The structural measure number one is quite simple. Does your hospital have a written procedure or guideline that defines a standard set of vital signs for pediatric patients? The process measure uh, number one is the percentage of pediatric patients presenting to the ED that have a standard set of vitals collected. Your second process measure are the percentage of pediatric patients with abnormal vital signs that are included in the notification process. 
then process measure three is about the percentage of pediatric patients that have a pain assessment at triage. So we're particularly looking at one element of that vital sign uh, standard. And then lastly, we have one optional measure for those hospitals that are willing to take the extra step. So you'll remember that we mentioned the timeliness um, with communication um, and then the escalation of care. And so here we have process measure number four, which is the median time from recognition of abnormal vital signs or pain to the first intervention. So I'll walk you through these, uh, the variables. And these are just a snapshot of the variables that we will be collecting for each of these measures. So for structural measure number one, which is the presence of that procedure or guideline, We'll ask that you upload a, a copy of your procedure or guideline into our data portal. Um, and then we're going to ask you specific information about the policy itself. So tell us what do you have as a core set of vitals? What, um, how are you assessing pain? Is there a mention, uh, any mention of the notification criteria, pain assessment, um, or Glasgow Coma Scale? We'll also ask that if you ask whether or not your site has identified the standard for normal vital sign ranges based on age or weight, and then tell us um, or indicate which standards being used by your site. For variable, the variables for process measures one and three, which relate to uh, the percentage of kids that have a standard set of vitals or have a pain assessment, you'll see that these are the list of variables that we're collecting. Heart rate, was it assessed, yes or no? Respiratory rate, temperature, pulse ox, pain, mental status, and then mental health. And literally, these are just yes or no questions. We are not asking you for the actual values of each of these uh, standards. For process measure number two, which relates to the percentage of kids with abnormal vital signs that are included in your notification process to the care team, we simply want to know, did all the vital signs fall within standard normal range uh, based on your guidelines, yes or no? Um, did any of those vital signs meet the threshold for abnormal vital sign notification? So did any of them meet your site's criteria for notification? And then if they did, did your site actually act upon that and initiate the notification process? And then lastly, for the optional measure, um, we are asking for um, a couple of pieces of information about your first intervention. So remember, this measure relates from the time of recognition to your first intervention. And we are asking questions related to IVIO placement, um, whether there was airway intervention, um, if there were targeted medications administered, and you can see the bumble for an expanded list of those measures, or whether there were any comfort measures applied. And that will be a yes or no. We'll ask for a date and time stamp. And if there were medications involved, we'll ask for the dosing for that. Um, and don't forget that you can find an expanded list of those variables on pages five through eight of the intervention bundle that's included in the handout section of the control panel. So for resources, um, please take a moment at some point today or over the next couple of days to visit our file sharing site. You'll see the link listed here. Uh, we have a couple different pieces of information for you all in this uh, sort of box. You'll see the intervention bundles listed there. We have foundational articles related to just the collaborative in general. We have a section for data use agreements, um, learning sessions, uh, and then the calendar for 2018 and 2019. Uh, and then you'll also be able to do sort of a deeper dive for bundle two that we've presented today. So there's recommended readings that are currently posted. Uh, there is a section for supplemental resources, which has a host of clinical decision support tools. You'll find copies of evidence-based guidelines from everything from bronchiolitis to urinary tract infections. Um, remember, we're not endorsing any of those tools, but it's really just a supplemental resource for your site. And then remember that uh, we have a copy of the intervention bundle available there, and I'll also be posting a copy of the recording and today's slides for future use. And one thing I did want to go back and mention is that for these quality measures that are listed here, each site will get an individual report on their uh, their performance on these measures. And so 
We will be uh, developing dashboards so that your site can generate run charts, control charts related to each of these quality measures that are listed. And so now what I'll do is pass it to Kate to discuss data collection. Great, thanks Crystal. And we are so grateful uh, to our sister uh, National Center, the National EMS for Children Data Analysis Resource Center, um, termed MEDARC, uh, for their support and effort to develop a real data collection system uh, so that we can provide these individual uh, reports to you because it's in order for you to make changes and to measure the quality of care being delivered to children in your emergency department, you really need to see your own performance. And that's why um, we've worked so closely with them over the last year and a half to try to develop a system where you can actually get those measures and get those reports so that you have um, the talking points for your emergency department and for your uh, institution uh, to be able to gain buy-in and to demonstrate the effectiveness or impact of the work that you're doing. Um, so in order to be able to support you through that and to provide you with these measures and metrics, uh, we do need those data use agreements. Those are, of course, through the University of Utah, which is where NEDARC is housed. Um, so those do need to be established. We recognize that there were some delays in getting uh, those data use agreements to you. Uh, and so uh, we, we are grateful for the efforts that you're doing to make sure those happen as quickly as possible, but recognize uh, that there may be uh, some stragglers in terms of being able to get those done in time. Um, NEDARC has worked very closely to develop this whole data portal. It's extremely user-friendly. We're grateful to John Brummett, who's also done a lot of work with the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, uh, to develop this so that it's extremely user-friendly. Um, over the summer, we will be releasing some videos and a whole how-to guide on this data portal so you can see firsthand what this looks like, familiarize yourself with the data dictionary and understand what's being asked. We try to minimize any data collection as much as possible um, so that uh, we're not increasing the workload on you, but making sure that you can actually measure your own progress. Uh, but we'll be walking you through that over the coming months. Uh, as we mentioned, of course, every site has ownership of their own data. We will not be sharing any individual site-specific data to anyone else. We will be working with the trainer so that they can understand overall um, engagement in terms of uh, progress made, participation, things of that nature, but we will not be sharing any site-specific performance data with any other site. Um, this is where it comes back to the culture of a collaborative and the transparency. And we really encourage you all within your teams and during these team meetings to think about creating your own sort of confidentiality agreement about what's spoken in those uh, meetings stays there. But nobody else will have direct access to any of your data or your performance for your site. This is owned individually by those of you who are participating in the collaborative for your site. Um, but again, we are also grateful to uh, our folks at NEDARC, um, particularly uh, Patty Schmuel, who is working uh, tirelessly to create dashboards for every single site uh, so that you can see your own progress. So you can log on, uh, you can see uh, your performance related to those quality measures that we talked about. Um, you can see control charts and run charts. We'll be talking to you more about those over these coming months. These are common charts. Um, used in quality improvement science. Uh, so you will become more and more familiar with this over the couple months. So if you don't know those terms, um, please don't run away scared. We're gonna, we're gonna help support you and get you there. And those IHI modules are, are really fantastic in setting the foundation for you. Uh, in addition to the intervention-specific dashboards, uh, I mean the site-specific dashboards, excuse me, we will have intervention-specific dashboards. So this will be aggregate data for all sites that are participating in a single bundle. You'll be able to benchmark yourselves against other sites that are also participating. And then finally, we'll have a comprehensive uh, dashboard for the Global Collaborative where all of you can see um, the progress that's being made and the work that's being done um, across all 16 um, uh, teams. Uh, but really, this will be an aggregate across all of 146 sites. 
So hopefully that explains um, those items well, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions about that, but I'm gonna turn it back to Crystal uh, to talk a little bit about the housekeeping. Thanks, Kate. Um, so here are your action items. So for educational purposes, on July 1st, we will be sending an email out to all of the pediatric champions and co-champions um, to share login information for the IHI uh, QI education modules. Um, you will have access for about two and a half months to that portal, so we will encourage you um, to make the most of that time um, to really um, work on those modules. Um, there will be a series of suggested readings available on our file sharing site, so take a moment to download some of those files um, and also take a moment to look at the sections in the intervention bundle related to tools and resources um, just to get caught up on some of that information. Um, Administrative-wise, as Kate mentioned, don't forget that we are working feverishly um, with NEDARC. Our NEDARC is actually working feverishly to um, establish your data use agreements. Um, so if you have not heard from us already, please let us know. Um, and we will be reaching out in the coming weeks to ensure that all of our sites are ready to submit data. Uh, collaborative specific, we will be sending an environmental scan. And really, it's a survey to help us understand how does your site sort of currently address abnormal vital signs? What vital signs are you collecting? What standards do you currently have in place? That will be something that's also released on July 1st. Um, and then there's the site visit survey that everyone was asked to complete um, about a month ago. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please complete that. And then as you'll see listed here, July 1st, we're asking for your data use uh, agreements to be completed. We know that that is somewhat of a very conservative date, but if you know that your hospital administrator is sitting on that document, um, it never hurts to just check the status of it. Um, we will be working with uh, your trainers uh, to send you a comprehensive sort of messaging about the intervention bundles, um, sort of month by month calendar of what to expect uh, this fall. And remember that on September 1st, it's your go live for the piloting phase and we'll start some baseline data collection during that period. Um, a couple reminders. So thanks to everyone that joined the call. Don't hang up just yet. We still have some time for Q&A, um, but I just want to remind you that we have our next deep dive on July 10th, where we will be discussing interfacility transfers. Uh, weight in kilograms will be uh, discussed on July 17th, and there will be um, a deeper dive for the, the disaster planning bundle, which will primarily focus on implementation, workflows, and data submission on July 31st. And that invite will be going out uh, within the coming days for the disaster planning part two. Um, so at this time, what I'll do is remind everyone that we are offering CNE and CME credit for uh, this session. Um, so re Remember, click on the link. You'll see it also listed in the handout section um, and enter abnormal vital signs deep dive and you can earn credit for joining today's session. And now what we're going to do is uh, keep a lookout in our chat box um, or the questions panel. Are there any questions related to the content that we've discussed today, um, be it related to the background, related to abnormal vital signs, or the PRQC design, or even possibly related to our AIM statement, intervention strategies or variables. So Kate, um, any comments you wanna make before we let everyone go? Yeah, I just wanna mention one thing, which is uh, Crystal shared with you all uh, the timing for uh, the upcoming deep dives on July 10th, 17th, and 31st. Uh, we recognize that this is all during the summer. Some of you may have vacation plans. Uh, and you may not be able to attend a certain bundle that you're really interested in. All of these will be recorded and uh, on the web so that if for some reason you miss it or can't be there, uh, we will make it available to you. Um, so please don't feel like all is lost if you uh, happen to be out of the country or unavailable to attend one of those. But so, please feel okay. free to submit any questions through the chat box if you have um, any comments, questions uh, that came up after today's session. 
So we actually have a question. One of those is related to when will these slides be available to print? So within the next hour, the slides will formally be on the file sharing site. Um, and we're actually not just sending you guys a PDF, but the actual PowerPoint um, presentation, because we're hoping that what you'll do is adapt these slides for your educational training with your care team. Um, so give me an hour, and I'll have it posted on the site for you. Kate, the next question that we have is, how much time should we expect per week uh, that should be dedicated to this intervention bundle? Sure, um, and this is a question that came up before, and I think it's all going to be site dependent. So we estimated no more than two to four hours per week uh, for any given bundle, um, but it really depends on the time that you have available, the amount of buy-in uh, and support you have from your site to implement changes, uh, and and how you the pace that you want to take uh, to move forward. Uh, we, our recommendation is somewhere between two and four hours per week. Um, but again, it's going to be uh, individually uh, dependent. The other thing that I would add is that over this, the course of this summer, as you've seen, we're really diving deep into the content of uh, this entire collaborative. So this is really what we would call the mobilization phase. And as we end out the summer, we'll be uh, diving deep into the implementation phase. And you'll see that it may take us a bit of time to really ramp you all up into full implementation mode. Uh, we're going to be providing you with a lot of guidance about how to uh, implement uh, these quality imp improvement efforts at your site. So just know that these next couple of months are really focused on the content, but we're not going to just release you uh, without giving you a lot more guidance on really how to be successful in the implementation piece. Uh, so please be on the lookout as we, we move more into that space. All right, Kate, we have another question. It is, is it expected that we contribute to all bundles or pick one to focus on? Great. Uh, thanks for that question. So again, um, this is uh, sort of to the tune of, to, of choose your own adventure. Um, this is based on the gaps that exist at your institution, the amount of support that you have at your institution. Uh, you can choose to work on one bundle, or you can choose to work on all four bundles, uh, or anywhere in between. So again, this is site-specific. This is based on the needs of your site and what uh, you have the ability to accomplish. We're here to support all of you um, in as few or as many of these bundles as is needed, uh, and we expect there to be cohorts. Uh, working through different phases at different times um, across all four of these intervention bundles. Okay, Kate, we have another question, and I think I can um, answer this one. It's, um, are the models that were presented earlier today located in the file sharing site with instructions on how to complete? So. Um, at this point, I would say that you have snippets of each of these tools, for example, the one Baker Scales or ESI. Um, some of them are copyrighted material, so we couldn't necessarily just paste them onto our file sharing site. Um, but what we can do is work with you to identify the correct source to find some of those materials um, or even to submit a request uh, to the organization or entity to get a formal copy of these tools. Um, so what I'll do, um, I'll put that on my list as an action item. Um, and so when you get your implementation guide, uh, what we'll do is include instructions specifically for this bundle for some of the tools that are being listed. So be on the lookout for that. Um, one of the other questions that came in, Kate, was would it be appropriate to stem off of this bundle and create a pediatric sepsis protocol? So um, there is a uh, sepsis collaborative, and really what you'll see with each of these bundles that we tried to focus on a very specific element within the care of children. So um, patient safety, of course, is weight in kilos. Abnormal vital signs is the triage process that certainly feeds into uh, a subset of patients, such as those patients in uh, septic shock. Um, more broadly, perhaps, just shock in general. Uh, the interfacility transfers is on the back end, and then, of course, disaster planning. So, um, you know, it's, again, up to your individual site how you move forward with this and to what extent 
uh, you're successful, we would encourage you to make sure that um, you're able to implement all of the elements of a given bundle um, as much as possible before moving into something much deeper like uh, the entire septic shock collaborative. Although uh, we would certainly um, be supportive in, in folks doing so if they have the ability to. Um, you may find that at your site, uh, you focus on specific populations um, of children uh, around uh, these individual bundles because you recognize those as gaps uh, within your uh, particular data. Um, but the goal of this collaborative is not to take it to the extent of the Pediatric Septic Shock Collaborative. Um, that was uh, a project that was really rolled out uh, with uh, the, uh, a large group of children's hospitals who have high volumes of pediatric patients. Um, many of the sites participating in this collaborative have uh, much smaller volumes, and so the uh, frequency of seeing children in septic shock is uh, uh, much more rare uh, or much lower, and so it may be more challenging. Uh, that is why we've chosen a more general uh, kind of infrastructure-based approach of focusing on global triage, which we know is a gap. Uh, but again, uh, we certainly have tools available that we can guide you to if you are one of those sites that's really uh, progressing quickly uh, through a particular bundle and uh, is ready to take it to a higher level. And Kate, so to piggyback off of that, if you guys um, are able to see my screen, this is just a screen uh, uh, this is actual the actual file sharing box. It is very similar to Dropbox, um, and you'll notice that, as Kate mentioned, there's a section within the Bundle 2 for Abnormal Vital Signs um, that has a series of algorithms that have been uh, developed by American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, for example, here is the Pediatric Septic Shock. Oh, sorry the septic shock tool um, that's available for viewing, which definitely has a strong focus on the early recognition um, of abnormal vital signs. Um, then there's a series of evidence-based guidelines by which Kate mentioned we are endorsing anything in particular, but they are there as additional sort of spin-off of the existing work. And you can find all of this content on the website, uh, on our file sharing site. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining today. If you do have other questions that come up, please feel free to uh, send us an email. Um, and please note uh, the dates for the other uh, bundle release and uh, we will go from there. So thank you all for your commitment to children and particularly the emergency care of children. And we look forward to working with you all.